because John, John said these words to me on the phone afterwards. This young man is going to complete two years of calculus in high school. There's nothing he can't do. Wow. Wow. So it's just, it's the power of achievement, especially in the quantitative disciplines that just keeps the doors open to a person's future. It's important. All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to our house. I'm so excited for today's show. We have such a special guest, a legend in the business, truly, Mr. Stephen Hake, over 17 years experience as a teacher, teaching grades 5th through 12th a math specialist, a member of NCTM and the California Mathematics Council and many more accomplishments. But he is very well known to us here in the RC community as being the author of six books in the Saxon Math series since 1985. And he's here with us today willing to answer some of our questions. So welcome, thank you so much for being here. And I'm very happy to be here with you, Karen, and with your, your crew. Yes, you are. We, we, I asked, I put a call out. Do you guys have any questions? And I got so many questions. So I'm going to um, uh, bring about the most frequently asked questions. But sure. just before all of that, I'd really love to hear how Saxon math was born. I did a video on this, the controversial history of Saxon math, but I'd love to hear more of your story, how um, your role, how, how it came to you, what you were doing at the time when this big project came to you and some more of your story. Sure. Well, we should start with John Saxon because all things Saxon start yes. with John. Uh, <laughs> he was uh, Air Force, uh, Army Air Corps. He was a career uh, military officer. He had taught at Air Force Academy. Uh, when he retired, he retired to Norman, Oklahoma, and got a job teaching math at Oscar Rose Community College at the time. I think it's a four-year school now, but it was a community college at the time. So here's an Air Force Academy instructor, professor, teaching adults college algebra. And he was chagrin when he would give these fabulous lectures and the students on test day would forget what he taught them. So he thought, well, what if we just practiced the final exam every day for every assignment? And so he created a book that was published by Prentice Hall. Most people don't realize that, but he did create a community college textbook uh, published by Prentice Hall. And used it in his own classes at Oscar Rose Community College. And then he thought, why am I teaching these adults when I could be teaching high school freshmen college algebra or algebra? So that's when he launched on his Algebra One textbook. And he did that in about 1980. Uh, he refinanced his house. I think he went $80,000 into debt to get his book uh, edited and published. And he was basically selling this Algebra One textbook out of the trunk of his car. I mean, wow. he worked his publishing house. I mean, his home was his publishing house uh, for many years. We visited uh, probably 1987 and his company was still in his house. And he had some employees that would just occupy different rooms of the house. Wow. So he was a one-man publisher until a Reader's Digest article about him broke. Trevor Armbrister wrote an article about him. John was just a, uh, a skilled marketing person. You know, he just was able to grab the attention. He was a, as a, a soldier always looking for a war, and he found one in the, <laughs> with the math establishment. So that was when he had to hire his first employee because he, the, his phone kept ringing and he couldn't get any work done. <laughs> so that was uh, the start of Saxon Publishers. It was actually Grassdale initially, and then he changed the name to Saxon Publishers. But my first book was uh, published under the name Grassdale Publishers, which was later changed to Saxon Publishers. So back to my story, uh, 
I've been teaching math for 10 years in El Monte, California, which is more or less a blue collar community. And I was, well, when I first started teaching math, I remember clearly my first couple of months of teaching math because I used the textbooks that were provided for us. And we went through the first unit and uh, gave the test, the students did fine. Went through the second unit, gave the test, added some questions from the first unit. And of course they hadn't heard anything. They couldn't remember anything from the first unit. Oh, and I no. knew instantly, this is not going to work. I'm not going to waste my time teaching them if they're not going to remember. So we just gathered up all the books, put them in the closet, closed the door, and I started writing my own assignments for students from that day on. And I did that for about eight years I would, uh, as a departmentalized seventh, eighth grade teacher. I would teach five classes of math a day and the students were at all different levels, each class. So I would create content for each of those classes. So it gave me a lot of experience. Every day I'm writing an assignment based on what they had, with the feedback that I'm getting from the students. Wow, in real time. Day. So just yeah. every day, feedback, new assignment, feedback, new assignment. And it was working really well. And one of the things that really was a necessary ingredient is that when I first started teaching, our gate teacher, gifted and talented coordinator in the district said, hey, why don't we have math contests among our six schools that have seventh and eighth grade students? And so we created math teams and there were four students on your math team and you would compete against the top four students from these other five schools in the school district. And we won the first year and we won the second year. And they changed the format, we won the third year. And they changed the format to make it more fair and we won and we just kept winning. So I think people started to realize there must be something going on at that school where with that teacher, right. it is really working. And I was always trying to get the kids further along. And so one, uh, one day I was in our local library and I was looking at some algebra books because I wanted to get you know, more content ideas for creating my own assignments. And so I left the book stacks and started walking through, you know, walking to leave the library. And I was passing through the periodical section. And I don't know, it seemed almost like a vision. I just <laughs> saw it in big block letters, algebra, as I'm walking through this periodical section. And I'm overcome with curiosity. Algebra in the periodical section? So I started this search, looking all around the, for any magazine that might have algebra on it. And I came to a National Review magazine published by William F. Buckley. And it's the results of a field test of a new algebra book in Oklahoma City Schools. So I'm fascinated. I opened up the article and I'm reading about this guy, this retired Air Force Colonel, John Saxon, who had written an algebra book and as I'm reading through the article, I'm realizing this guy teaches math the same way I do. <laughs> so it was a kind of a revelation, like there's somebody else out there that teaches math the same way. Well, at that point, I had written some materials that we were using in our own school and in our school district. I was motivated to do it because my own kids were approaching sixth, seventh, eighth grade level. And I wanted them to be better prepared when they came to me so our team could be stronger, our math team could be stronger. So I had created this content and our, we were using it in two schools. The following year, actually, we used it in every school in the school district. And so I wrote a letter to John Sapp. Well, actually, I first ordered a copy of his algebra book because I was so curious. And I started just using that book with my eighth grade students. And after 
several weeks, I thought, this is just fine. I don't, this is, makes it easy for me because wow. you know, it's so similar to what I've done at the other grade levels, lower grade levels. So I wrote a letter to John Saxon, you know, dear Colonel Saxon, uh, <laughs> I'm using your algebra book. It's working great in my classroom. It's very similar to the books that I've written at the fourth, fifth, and sixth grade level. I read in the article how much trouble you went through to get your books in print. And I wonder if you have any advice to, you know, for me about how I could get my books in print. I thought he would maybe have some advice. Right. Um, but instead, I didn't realize he was already writing a book to precede Algebra 1, entitled Algebra 1 Half. And he was writing a book to follow Algebra 1 called Algebra 1 and a Half, which later became Algebra 2. I think the one and a half name just wasn't working <laughs> in the marketplace. Uh, yeah. So that's how we actually first connected. We met in Long Beach. He was speaking at a conference in 1983, November of 83. And he said, I'll give you the same uh, deal Prentice Hall gave me. You publish a book that I like and I'll put it into print. Well, we were so close together in the way we, we taught. It was just a simple process of uh, reworking the materials that I've written for um, a book that would precede his Algebra 1 half book. And that was Math 76 or Math 76, as some people call it. But at that time, we just called it Math 76. There was no slash between the seven and the six. So the early editions, Math 76. And that's how we got started. Do you ever think, what if you didn't go to the library that day or walk by that periodical, how no, different your no, life would be? <laughs> yeah, Karen, there's just, there are a lot of things about this that just make it feel like um, this has been orchestrated. Yes. Uh, really pretty amazing. And just the fact that, you know, math books or textbooks themselves, especially at the K-8 level, they're not written by individuals. You know, they're written by development houses. Mm -hmm. So for one, you know, a person to write a book and get it published, that's just, in fact, that's why John Saxon had to publish the book himself. He had created an Algebra One book. It was highly effective. It was demonstrated to be effective by field tests in, in Oklahoma City schools, in many, many schools. So he went to the publishers in New York and Boston and said, hey, I've got a great book for you. And they said, that's not the way we, we write books. We're, we're not gonna publish it, we won't. And so he knew he had created a better mousetrap. And so he, he, uh, <laughs> you know, he just decided to finance, uh, publish it himself. And so he went $80,000 into debt to publish his first book. And about 20 years later, Saxon Publishers was the most valuable uh, privately owned publishing company in the world. And it's still going strong now. I mean, and we Saxon were talking about Math this earlier. Yeah, yeah the, during the, the pandemic. The kids, John had these, four kids that... It, that <laughs> yeah, the, it's, it's very high demand online still. Yes. <laughs> it's amazing. Well, it's very gratifying too. You know, writing for my own kids, I wanted my own kids to children, you know, to be well prepared. So it's really gratifying that so many kids across the country have been able to use and benefit this from this program. Yes. And, you know, before we go on to some of the Saxon textbook specific questions, I'm just curious your thoughts on this. Do, you know, I'm, I don't know what it's like teaching today. Is there that flexibility today where teachers, if they see a problem, they could take that feedback and create their own curriculum? Or is that just not something feasible today? Do you think an, another outsider today could do what John Saxon did back in the day? Or are it's just very different today? Well, for John Saxon, I think he picked the right book, because right level, you know, Algebra One, mm -hmm. because it would be possible to put that book into print and find a market for it. It's, it's a big enough demand, you know, an Algebra One book is a big enough demand, meaning there are enough 
students that would be using it mm -hmm. uh, so that you can grab a, a share of that market and it would finance the, the growth of your business. Uh, it's a lot harder at the K-8 level uh, for a teacher to do what I did. It was, I just had the trust of my principal. I had the trust of the district uh, curriculum, uh, assistant superintendent of curriculum and instruction. And they just let me, as long as we were getting good results, they let me create my own content. So, but it's a lot harder now with uh, court cases, equal access to the curriculum. Uh, you need to follow the district adopted curriculum. I would find it pretty frustrating right now. Right, exactly. And we talked about this earlier too, how for parents that are concerned, is there common core in these books? Or if the public schools are using these Saxon textbooks today, do they contain um, Common Core? Have they been changed? But they do not have any Common Core. There's a Common Core supplement that was later created for teachers right. who, if they wanted to use it, but the actual textbooks themselves, none of them do, correct? That is 100% uh, correct. So the, there have been four or five different ways of counting it, editions of these books. Uh, the first, second, third editions were all published by Saxon publishers. Uh, the fourth edition, and I, I say there's other ways of counting because Math 76 actually had a fourth edition uh, under Saxon publishers. But generally speaking, the fourth edition would have been the Harcourt Achieve edition, which was written in 2006, 2007. That's a year or two before Common Core. Mm -hmm. And the Harcourt Achieve Edition, the titles were changed from Math 54 to Math 87. Those four books, there was a book written before that, which was Math 3, I'm a third grade book, and a book that followed Math 87, which would be like an eighth grade book. So the titles were changed to Intermediate 3, 4, 5, designating third, fourth, and fifth grade. Intermediate 3, 4, 5, and course one, two, three, which is for six, seven, and eight. So math 76, let's say, would match course one, math 87 would match course two, and then there was a new book, uh, course three. And the course three book is a very solid pre-algebra book. It takes students through about all the operations within algebra, uh, in the appendix. So students would be super well prepared for algebra if they went through the course three book. Somebody asked me too, if, if these Saxon textbooks, if you go all the way through advanced mathematics calculus, is it enough to cover math AP exams or if any supplementation is needed? I there think it's- is, Yeah, there are two versions of the calculus book. Uh, the, there's an updated version which would be considered an AP course. So you'd want the second edition of the college, of, of the calculus book, because that's an AP level course. Okay, uh, that's good to but know. I didn't quite like finish the, uh, the comment about Common Core because after, uh, so Harcourt Achieve purchased Saxon Publishers uh, and they created the 20, the 2007, the 2007, 2008 edition. Uh, that was written by K through three level, Nancy Larson, uh, three through eight level by Stephen Haig. And you can trust those editions. Harcourt Achieve or Harcourt Publishers was acquired by Houghton Mifflin. Mm -hmm. It became Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, HMH. They republished the 2007 edition or 2008 edition to create a 2018 edition. They didn't change any of the lessons. They didn't change any of the problem sets. They didn't change any of the wording out of that 2007 edition. All they did in some of the white spaces, because the problem sets in, there's some white page space left on the page before they go to the next lesson. So in 
for that white space, we inserted certain content, a little bit of content to meet the Oklahoma state adoption requirements. Not common core, just Oklahoma state adoption requirements. So the 2018 edition is still not directly tied to common core because it's just using the 2007 edition, which was also, which preceded common core. Right. So anything that HMH created for common core would have been a supplement and it's not part of the textbook itself. And so if parents are really concerned about it, they can ask if their kids are in public school, ask them if they're using that supplement or not. But rest assured, it's not in the books. That's right. right. Thank you. Well, you know, here's a little funny question. It, it's, this is something that kind of circulates in, in our circles. The dots <laughs> on the hard code. So do two dots mean that it's a second edition? That's right. Or is that not reliable? It oh, is? What, yeah, and that was John's design. Uh, we want to do something. John designed the the, the covers. covers. So if there's nothing, the it's first edition, correct? That's right. But if it's a third edition, it's a three-dimensional kind of an image for the letters. So that's good to know. Now, another question that comes up often is, is Saxon math a spiral or mastery, or is it a combination of both? And you sent me a really interesting article about interleaving effect, yeah. right? Is that correct? And I've yeah. been studying a lot about memory and it just confirmed everything that I was learning. I was thinking how it's more beneficial to the mind, these connections that you're constantly switching back from versus just short-term memory and then forgetting it, right? <laughs> Which happens right. with students all the time. So, so you can use, you share a little bit about that? Yes. So you use the term interleaving and, and if you're viewers are interested, they could uh, follow up and just research interleaving. Uh, another term that they might want to look at is automaticity. Automaticity. And Benjamin Bloom was a guru in education circles for decades. Uh, I think he was most famous for uh, taxonomy of educational objectives. And uh, I remember seeing that, in, you know, back in the early, even in the 70s and then in the 80s. But his research towards the end of his career was in automaticity. And uh, automaticity is just automating skills uh, and then putting together more skills to, and automating that. So he would use it as, as an example. It, and he looked at automaticity. He looked at, actually what he looked at was outstanding performances in the psychomotor realm, right? whether it was um, mathematic ability, typing ability, reading ability, um, gymnastics ability, diving off of a high dive. So let's, let's take, let's say Greg Luganis would have been a diver at the time. So if he's going off of the three meter board, if he has to think about what he's going to do in his dive, if he has to think about each move, he'd just be a grease spot on the top of the, of the pool because it wouldn't work. He's just automated all these different movements over you know, practice to make a perfect, you know, perfect dive. Mm -hmm. And that ability to clump things together and automate them uh, is what frees the mind to do other things. So let's take problem solving, which is a really big deal in math education. Yes. And they say, oh, students shouldn't be doing things like memorizing basic facts. They should be doing problem solving. Well, I'll tell you, if you don't memorize basic facts, then it's going to be a problem just to figure out what eight times seven is. Yes. Um, why not automate? Why not use your precious memory to automate these skills and concepts so that you don't have to think about it? Instead, you can just focus in on the problem itself, the understanding the problem, the meaning of the problem, 
And you can free your mind from all the burdens of, well, how do I do long division? So right. automating these skills is really important, which is why in a note to you, I mentioned the importance of facts practice. Mm -hmm. Facts practice would, are, are, would, is not just memorizing you know, your addition, your multiplication tables and addition and subtraction facts. That's great. You know, absolutely, students should, should do that. But why not do some, memorize some other things too, like fraction decimal percent equivalence or um, measurement equivalence, you know, uh, or, you know, how many ounces are in a pound or how many inches are in a foot and feet in a yard and yards in a mile. And memorizing these things just commits to memory some things that you don't have to put your mind to when it comes to solving problems. Um, so this interleaving and this automating basic skills and basic facts uh, has, it, it really affects how well the students are going to do as they go up the, as, as math gets more and more difficult for them. I mean, not more and more difficult for them, but more and more challenging, more and more complex if they've automated these basic skills, then it becomes easier. For example, algebra. If students are having trouble with algebra, it's usually because their arithmetic skills aren't very strong. Or if they're having trouble with calculus, it's because their algebra skills aren't very strong. It's a weakness further down the line that's, that's causing them to have some trouble. So being sure that you're mastering things all along the way is really important for the future success. So you asked about mastery learning and spiral um, curriculum. And I understand that people try to categorize Saxon in some way or try to understand it in some way. And I, I think I, what I would say is it's, Saxon is its own animal. You know, it's its yes. own thing. It's not... Um, let's say we, we, we created a language arts curriculum and you, you kind of like create a, a typical textbook because you're writing it out in a logical way for yourself and then you Saxonize it. Mm -hmm. See, so we've made a verb out of it, you know, internally, we've made a verb out, out, out of it so that we, we know how the Saxon method works. So if we create a Saxonized version, we can feel assured that the students are going to learn and remember the content far better than if they're using a chapter type textbook. Yes. So it's its own animal, it's its own thing. Um, yes, there are elements of mastery to it and, and spiraling to it. If, if people um, find comfort in using those words or if it helps them to understand uh, you know, the structure of the program. But John used the words incremental development and continual review. You know, I would add the word automaticity. I just think that's a real important ingredient. And John, there is an interview out there uh, between John Saxon and Benjamin Bloom where he talked a little bit about you know, this automaticity. Um, but there are several things about Saxon that's unique. One thing I mentioned earlier is that individual authors are creating the content. That doesn't happen in other publishers. Mm -hmm. You know, the publishers are, you know, even at Harcourt uh, Achieve when we were creating a new edition, they created a new edition for the high school books. Well, if it has John Saxon's name, John Saxon's name on it, then that's a book that he wrote. Now, there might be one that says Saxon without John's name on it. It says Saxon Algebra One. Well, that's a book that he didn't write. Or Saxon Geometry, that's a book that he didn't write. Um, Saxon Algebra 2. If it has, if it doesn't have John's name on it, then it's not one that he wrote. And it was written by a, a development house. By a development house, I mean, the publisher doesn't have internal authors. They have internal editors. If they want content, they write specifications out, send the specifications to a company that hires a bunch of math people and they create the content and send it back and then the editors go through it. 
That's the way most programs are written, not by individual authors. So if it's written by an individual author, you kind of get to know the author a little bit as you're going through the program because that author's personality can't help but get incorporated somewhat into the content right. of the book. So people got to know John Saxon and they would invite him to speak at their graduations or you know, they just really appreciated him because they got to know him through his books. So what do you think, obviously he's not here with us now, but do you think he would be happy with the direction that the company's gone and the, how the books are you know, being published today? Or do you think he'd have an issue? Like we talked about the quality, right? Because the older books, the hardcover, parents really love that. And they can tell the difference between the pages, you know, from some of the newer homeschooling editions. You know, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, um, maybe one. <laughs> <laughs> Not to put day, you on the spot. <laughs> there was a day that um, John Saxon's kids inherited the company. He has four kids two sons, two daughters. They're, they're all in the medical field. Three of them are doctors and one of them is a pharmacist. They're all very capable people, wonderful people. And, the, and so they felt responsible for running the company, but it wasn't smooth sailing to be running that company. And it was a pretty big company, 200 employees probably. And wow. you know, whenever you get that size, there's gonna be a little bit of uh, dissension and. So they received an offer from Harcourt Achieve that they just couldn't turn down. And they just felt like, well, if, if a major publisher will pick up Saxon publishers, pick up the programs, then maybe they can really take it to the next level, you know, get it out there even wider, more widely used. And so they went ahead and agreed to sell the company. Now, there's this, they were in Norman, Oklahoma. They had an office in Norman, Oklahoma. And there's a story that I believe is true, is that the storm rolled through on the day that they announced that they were going to sell Saxon publishers and lightning struck the building and no. took a chunk off of the corner of the building and no. <laughs> some people were saying, John doesn't like this idea at <laughs> all. <laughs> oh, I could see that. Yeah. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, because he, this was his baby, right? I mean, yeah. he, he believed in this so strongly. He had such a vision and clarity, right? Didn't his wife say he was just burdened with this, like, clarity? Um, and then you had told me a story, I hope you could tell again, where there was a, a problem with one of the additions, and then what did he do? <laughs> yes, the Algebra 2 book. Um, yes. Some of the, there were, you know, as you go through, you're doing, because he would field test his, his manuscripts. He would test his manuscripts. That's another thing that publishers don't do, but John would do. So he would let the manuscript you know, be out in the schools for a year, and find mistakes, correct mistakes, just modify the program based on the feedback. And some of the errors, maybe quite a few of the errors weren't caught in this Algebra 2 book. And so it went to press. And when it came back, there was just scores of pallets of Algebra 2 books and it was, they were full of errors. And so he brought the people in the company together and just watched them shred the books. Wow. He wasn't going to put out all two books. It was a very expensive mistake. Um, yes, wow. he really cared about the quality of the programs that he put out. He wanted them to be clean products. Um, you said something about you know, his focus uh, when I met John, he had already had quadruple bypass surgery once. Wow. He went through quadruple bypass surgery a second time. Uh, he knew that he didn't have a whole lot of time. And so he just was so focused on getting through the calculus book, getting the physics book out. He was really focused on the, he was on a mission. You know, mm -hmm. just like he was in the military. This is a mission to save 
math education in the United States. And he did, his company did become the biggest independent you know, publishing company in the world, but I think he had grander visions. You know, a fellow in, uh, in uh, a sales representative in Indiana called John one day to say, uh, we really had a very successful campaign in Indiana. We're in half the schools of Indiana. Wow. And John said, what about the other half? <laughs> <laughs> so that's how he thought, huh? Yes. Wow. Yeah. Uh, I could just... A, you know, a problem in math education, a disaster in math education, and it did not just happen. It was caused. It was caused by following the untested recommendations of self-proclaimed experts in math education. And he offended a lot of people by saying that. But I don't know, I think it's, it's true because you, know, you can imagine, oh, this will probably work. And then you impose it. You, it's just, you're making kids into guinea pigs by imposing it on them and it doesn't work. And John wasn't that way. John would just say, let's see if it works. And if it does work, then we'll, you know, we'll just go head to head, mano a mano is what he would say, <laughs> head to head. <laughs> and um, we'll see who's got the more effective program. So that, that's really interesting. I want to get your thoughts on this because I'm sure you've heard of Jaime Escalante, another, you know, L.A., teacher sure. who made a huge impact and i read how you know when he retired he he moved up to um up north california another teacher took over but then after that teacher left the levels of kids passing those calculus exams it dropped by 80 percent. it was it's a, it went downhill really fast but the success rate with saxon it's really unique in that it didn't matter who the teacher was the books really did the work themselves. And the, I'm sure that the success and the grades only just kept improving. Would you say that's true? Yes, you mentioned Jaime Escalante. and he, he taught at Garfield High School. It was not a nine through 12 high school, it was a 10 through 12 high school. So you really only had them for three years, but just got amazing results. Yes. And when I was uh, a math special, a specialist teacher in our school district and wasn't just kind of tied to my classroom. I've, I went to Garfield High School to visit him and just to see what he was doing. I mean, I wanted to see who's, how are these people getting these really great results? Yes. And he was creating his own content too. I mean, it would have been fabulous for him to, to tie in with John. And John actually made an effort to, to do that. Um, but Jaime Escalante, maybe well, they didn't just see eye to eye or something, but they it just he declined the opportunity, which is too bad. It would have been great to have his materials in print through uh, Saxon Publishers. Uh, but and then he moved up to I think Sacramento area. Sacramento, uh, yes. I'm sure it was two strong personalities, right? <laughs> that yes. I'm sure it would be challenging. But that's interesting. So I didn't know that he was kind of writing his own. That seems to be the recurring theme, right? <laughs> Is breaking away from those textbooks yes, and, and he would, creating I mean, your own. He had, he had signed contracts with teachers and with the parents and with his students. He met in a music room. So he had a really big audience. I mean, yes. Where the, and uh, they would come in on Saturdays, they'd come in on vacations, because he only had them for three years, or actually by the time they took the AP test, maybe only two and a half years. So he had to cram in a lot of extra time with the students. Um, it's a lot of work to get students to be successful. But, and it is, you know, how do you package a curriculum that will be effective for a broad spectrum of students? And, I think that's one of the secrets of Saxon math too, is that you know, a lot of really bright, bright kids, math, mathematically gifted kids, they're probably gonna be pretty successful no matter what program you use. But how do you get more? How do you increase 
the range of students that can be successful. Yes. And there's something about the authors that wrote for Saxon publishers, John Saxon and Nancy Larson and I all had similar experiences in that we worked with students. We had a range of students that we worked with, which included kids that found math difficult. And that's important because if you're mathematically able, then you don't know what's hard. And for example, um, I frequently refer to, in relating to this, uh, rounding numbers. Let's say um, uh, $478 is closest to, you know, which hundred dollars? Well, to me, it just seems obvious it's closest to $500. It's closer to $500 than it is to $400. That's just simple rounding. That's not simple for some people. Mm -hmm. I don't know why it's not simple for them. It just seems so obvious to me. And it took me three years to finally believe that's a difficult skill. So when students show you over and over what's hard for them, then you try to accommodate them in your writing, you know, in, in, well, in what you're creating for them to work on. So one of the secrets of Saxon math, I think, is that you know, on this mathematical journey, we put the stepping stones kind of close together so that more students can be successful in that journey instead of you know, falling because they can't take that big step. It doesn't seem to slow down the bright kids. They can just move along. They're just fine. But we're making accommodations for students that, that struggle as well. Uh, as long as they continue to uh, get, it, get their work correct, then yes. they can keep moving. And I love that because, you know, the reason why I know about High Miscons is because I grew up in Bell in, in, uh, near LA. And I went to one of those schools where, and this is why I, I really appreciate John Saxon in those interviews saying how, you know, it doesn't matter if you have more pigment in your skin, you have the same gray matter, the same capabilities. And, you know, we, it's easy for maybe teachers to dismiss it, or, you know, we, we're coming from households where English, is not even being spoken. There's no transportation to libraries or cars, you know, but instead of, like you said, dumbing down the curriculum, you're really challenging the kids and bringing them up. And it really does so much for the self-esteem to think I can do it. And, and you work hard at it. I just, I, I love that. And I love that approach. And I don't know if it's being approached the same way today, you know, <laughs> but I, I, I think it showed the results. You, you proved it, you know, back There's then. There's a video that you played of, John, of the 60 minutes, in it, um, 60 minutes on John Saxon and the math controversy, the math wars. There's a segment in that video uh, where John Saxon is in Charlie Hodge's calculus classroom in Dallas, Texas. And he puts his hand on the shoulder of an African-American uh, student who's in Charlie's classroom. And this young man's a junior and he's taking calculus. And I don't remember the exact words in that, in that video, but it was to this effect because John, John said these words to me on the phone afterwards. This young man is going to complete two years of calculus in high school. There's nothing he can't do. Wow. Wow. So it's just, it's the power of achievement, especially in the quantitative disciplines that just keeps the doors open to a person's future. It's important. And I, it's the most poignant memory I have of John Saxon, because it, it tells what he was all about. Yes. Wow. I'm sure you have a lot of stories like that. I could just, 
listen to them all day because it, it's really inspiring. And I hope homeschooling parents, sometimes we can get, you know, caught up with the day to day and it could be overwhelming. And sometimes the emphasis is not so much academic, but sociological, you know, there's a lot of bullying going on. And and so this is a good reminder to parents that, yes, you know, the reasons why you're homeschooling, they're all very valid and important. But remember, too, we want, like you said, if they can think quantitatively, if they really can do this and problem solve, there's nothing that they can't do. This is a very big challenge, rewarding one that you're undertaking by homeschooling. But we can do it. They can do it. You can do it. And uh, it's very powerful. Just right? hang in there. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Exactly. Uh, so I wanted to talk to you because, you know, the way we do Saxon math with the uh, Robinson curriculum, I don't know if you ever talked to Dr. Uh, Art Robinson, but he recommended, you know, if, as long as they get 95% or above, they can move on to the next lesson or else they need to redo the lesson and slow down, maybe just do half uh, the lesson the next day. You're, you told me, you think 80% is a little bit more, more way. As long as they get 80% right on the lesson, they can keep moving forward. Would so you say also clarify. just, yes, please clarify. Okay. So in school settings, when you have a wide range of students, the real risk in using Saxon is that as each lesson gets a little bit harder, it never gets easier. Each lesson gets a little bit harder. Mm -hmm. that if students start falling behind, then it's really hard for them to catch up. They'll just fall farther and farther and farther behind. So it's, it's real important that students maintain at least an 80% correct, av uh, not average, but test scores, every single test. With, ho with homework, and your kids are going home and they're coming back and you don't know how much help they've had, but tests take place in the classroom, the teacher grades the tests. If they start scoring at any point below 80%, and that's just red flags, you've got to be sure that that kid gets intervention because pretty soon they're going to fall way behind. It'll just keep getting harder. So that's why I use the 80% figure. Okay, for now, tests. The Robinsons, yeah. uh, who can question the success? You know, yes. Of their, <laughs> of their kids, you know, yes. and, you know, they've done really well and they have good solid recommendations. And so what I would say with respect to their 95% level, let's say, is that the students can make small arithmetic errors or careless errors and be able to correct them is say, oh, no wonder, you know, yeah, I can get that right. But if, if it's a conceptual error, if it's something that they don't understand, then you better not let those accumulate. So even on this 80% criteria, which on a 20 question test, you know, you, you can miss four, but not more than four. And those four, better not be conceptual mistakes. I mean, they better be able to get those right by correcting it on the first try without being confused about it. You know, they, they, you know, they should just recognize that these are like just arithmetic errors or something like that. So it's, it's the difference between a careless mistake and something I just don't understand. And you can't let the, I just don't understand. You can't let those kinds of errors accumulate. Uh, yes. They have to figure out what's going on. So in some of the books, there's actually supplemental practice in these older editions in the back of the book. And so we didn't do it for every lesson, but we did it for ones that we, where we anticipated that they might need more practice. So if you're using some of the older editions, maybe in the back of the book, you'll find some additional practice on that. Or you just go back to the lesson and do those that practice set on that particular topic, do that. Or go find that kind of a question and do it in this lesson and the next lesson and the next lesson and the next lesson. Just focus in on that for a little bit. So it's a difference between mass practice and distributed practice. So with mass practice, you're 
doing a lot of exercises, handful of them, maybe a few more, to just practice that one skill. And then distributed practice as it comes every now and then as you're going through the review sets. And you need both kinds for good long-term memory. Yes. And I wanted to ask you, one of the big favorite things with parents with sex and math is, I, I think it's, you tell me, is it only a second edition where in the problems, it'll have a little parenthesis that tells you where what lesson that was covered in. So this problem 14, it'll tell you lesson 35, this next one, lesson 63. So they can go back. Is that just the second edition or are there other editions that have that? I don't think it was in the first edition, but it's in every, once it appeared, it's in every edition ever since. Okay, yeah, so the that's- Lesson the reference thing. numbers and the lesson reference numbers are there every, you know, in it is every so edition. Helpful. And in our grammar, grammar program, we do the same thing. We put lists and lists and reference numbers uh, for every exercise. I think so you gave us some great tips. Back. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because so, you know, I, this is what I've heard. There's three common errors, careless, just maybe writing it wrong, right. not, not lighting things up, computational, just arithmetic error. And then like you said, conceptual. So the, the first two are pretty easy to fix, but when it comes to conceptual, they're not getting it. You gave us, you know, practice, those math uh, handouts, the uh, supplemental things, because you say at this point, they really do need intervention. Even in a self-taught curriculum, you have yes. plenty of tools that they can use. But would you recommend for a student that's really struggling and they don't have their math facts memorized to take a break from math and just work on all the memorizing? Or is there a way they can kind of do both in tandem and it work out? So in the probably, I don't know when they started. I don't know if it was in the first edition. It might have been in the first edition, but we just started recommending fax practice every day. You know, like one blast of fax, of, of, we just called it fax practice, but it's all different kinds of, it might be multiplication fax most of the time, but it's just all different kinds of fax practice. Yes. And it's, it's timed written tests. Timed written tests. Timed written tests. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I know some people don't think that, I mean, that they're stressful. It's only stressful until the students can do it. And once they can do it, then it's not stressful anymore, then it's fun. And it becomes almost an, almost an athletic event. Like, how fast can I do it? Can I get under three minutes? Can I get under two minutes? There's something about the pressure of time. It just, I think it pushes it into the brain cells better. Uh, timed written practice is important. It really aids in that automaticity. So, you know, there's one multiplication facts page in there that I like because um, it's instead of being a hundred problems from zero times zero to nine times nine, it's just 64 from two times two through nine times nine. So you can do that one really fast. And yeah, they know their facts. That's all right, do it again. It's kind of like playing the piano, you know? Um, if, even if you're an expert, you're probably gonna play the scales now and then. You know, just it's just basic, keeping everything fresh, keeping, and besides that, doing it fast, it kind of, Kind of revs up the flywheel, and now you're 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 kind of at a up tempo, and now you can get through your assignment faster. Mm -hmm. These time written exercises are really valuable. I'm hammering it a lot, I know. But they no, are I'm really glad valuable. you are. And you know, I read both sides of the spectrum. You know, I, I try to understand both sides, and I've read that book, uh, "Faster Isn't Always Smarter." So I'm glad you're um, telling me this because. From what I read, for some kids, they freeze up, right? And then they don't do it correctly. They don't do it right. And they feel like, oh, I'm not good at math. And so then they just have this idea in their head, I'm not good at this. I'm not good at math. And it's obviously very bad in the long term. But then they'll do a non-timed assignment and they'll get everything right. So do you think it just is more practice if they just do it every day? that they'll get that confidence and kind of break through that, that stress that they get. 
Yeah, I don't know if you're referring to multiplication facts, but I want to tell you a story about Brenda. So she was in my fifth grade class. Um, and she was a pullout student. She, she was a special ed student, but she was pretty, pretty capable kid. Um, but she would be in my math class. And I wanted everybody in my class to, I, I just always want all my students to know their multiplication facts cold. Because knowing the multiplication facts is like the prerequisite for middle school and beyond. If you don't know your multiplication facts, you know, by the time you get out of third or fourth grade, then you're going to struggle in math ever after. Mm -hmm. So I just want them for their own sake to really know their multiplication facts. Brenda, she knew that she couldn't learn the multiplication facts. And she wasn't going to learn the multiplication facts. And I say, Sometimes a teacher's willpower has to exceed the student's won't power. <laughs> so Brenda and I sometimes had lunch together and sometimes had recess together. I mean, because I was just determined that she was going to learn a multiplication fact. And you just whittle it down, whittle it down. And you know, I probably should publish this little 30 lesson multiplication facts thing because it just breaks it down into smaller bites so once you they're pretty easy to learn down to about the last 10 and so we just kept working with brenda and so it took a few months but she got down there and she, and, and she could do it under five minutes that was the threshold and then she could do it under four minutes then she could do it under three minutes and she was so happy but i left that school and i didn't see brenda again but her special ed teacher was at, the, at another school where, where I taught. And she said, do you remember Brenda? And I said, sure. Well, she still struggles in some things, but she sure knows her facts. I mean, she's, she's really pretty good in math. And so that reassured me. That made me feel happy. Yes. And then many years later, um, I, I was on the school, local school board, and I was visiting that school where Brenda had attended. And I was talking to one of her teachers. Um, and she said, Do you remember Brenda? And I said, Yes. She said, I saw her in the grocery store the other day. She's she seems to be doing real well. And she asked me if I ever see you. And I said, Yes, he comes around the school. I see him sometimes. Well, tell Mr. Haight, he changed my life. Wow. You know, if if you think you can't do something, and then you find that you can, it kind of opens up the possibilities for your life. And you realize, if I really work at something, maybe I can really be successful. So, you know, uh, that's why I say sometimes your willpower has to exceed the student's willpower, because if it's important enough for the, you know, to you, for them to do that because you know what it will mean for their future. I mean, I wasn't expecting that, but I think it was just, it, it tell, told Brenda something about herself that um, made a real big difference for, for the rest of her life. Wow. It, it wasn't just the multiplication facts, but I'm sure that that didn't hurt her. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so just in conclusion, what, advice then would you give homeschooling parents who are using Saxon? and that's the majority of people who watch this channel who are using Saxon math would you say consistency is king not giving in <laughs> not letting them maybe manipulate you into getting out of, of memorizing all of their facts rote memory what advice could you give us parents well, there's certain advice that we gave, give to everyone. And that is, please use the books in order. Don't skip any books. Mm -hmm. Please do the lessons in order. Don't skip any lessons. Do all the exercises. Do the practice exercises for that lesson. And do all of the review set exercises. Don't let students 
uh, start falling behind with an abundance of errors. You know, if there start to be some conceptual errors, then maybe it's time to slow down, make sure they have that, because the way these books are written, every lesson gets harder. So it's not going to get easy again. So you really have to keep on top of it. Um, if students need help, then maybe you need to get help sometimes. Um, I love the idea of students uh, learning on their own, but you know, I, I know that some, I remember my daughter, very bright girl, you know, she was learning a lot of things on her own. And then she started talking one day and she's mispronouncing all these technical words because she's never heard anybody say them correctly. <laughs> so yeah. they can develop little misconceptions if they're learning on their own all the time. And if so, if the students start struggling and need some help, just get them some help. Um, if, if you can give them the help, then that's great. If you need somebody to, there's a Saxon help desk. There's a Saxon help desk. Uh, somebody answers the phone. Uh, his name is Bruce, and he can help students get through um, exercises. Oh, I that, didn't know that. But is difficult for them. Um, so it's really important to just stay on top of it. And then, of course, timed written tests. I just think that's so important. So think about memory for just a minute. For some reason, these math reformers denigrate memory. Mm -hmm. And so they just say, well, Saxon is just drill. Well, that wasn't effective enough. So they said, Saxon is just blind, mindless drill. Well, that wasn't effective enough. <laughs> Saxon is just drill and kill. Yeah. You know, and <laughs> they keep that. denigrating memory. But you know, there are some people that get to a certain age or get certain diseases and they recognize memory is precious mm -hmm. and it's slipping. And why would you tie your memory behind your back and not use it? Why not use all the mental resources that are available to you? Why not automate some of these basic skills and concepts and equivalences and just make life easier for yourself? And kids get good at it and they don't really they don't despise it. It's kind of fun to go fast. So, and and that going fast will help, help them to remember it better. So I would say those are the big things. Um, just don't do a lot of skipping and just be sure that the kids are staying on top of it all along the way. So just reminded me one other quick question, because I know some parents do this. They, they only do maybe for a problem set they'll say, okay, we're only going to do the even problems today, or we're only going to do the odd problems today. They, they think for some reason, the whole lesson set is too much. You would strongly advise against that, correct? <laughs> Don't yes, do that. Yes, I would strongly advise <laughs> against that. No, I think the worry be is- all the practice that you needed. You know, you wouldn't be getting all the practice that you needed. And one thing that we briefly talked about when we had a little phone conversation is the importance of a foundation mm -hmm. and that math is itself math itself the subject itself builds on itself so every idea in math is built on a preceding idea and, or concept and so the whole math structure just kind of rests on itself. But that's true about learning math too. So as you're learning it, you're learning it based on what you have learned before. So an analogy would be like a, a, a skyscraper. The taller the building, if you go to a construction site and you see a skyscraper about to be built, the taller the building is gonna be, the bigger the foundation is required. Mm -hmm. And it's really important to get a good solid foundation, K through eight, a really solid foundation. And so 
skipping some lessons, skipping some review sets, skipping some problems in the review set, skipping some books, you're, you're pretty much assuring that your foundation isn't going to be as dense, as solid, as large as it should be to hold what's going to be built on top of it. It's not just that, oh, my kid understands that concept and now we can move on. You want them to, to know it cold. Overlearning is good. Um, there are plenty of things that will challenge them later. And if you can get them fast enough, then they can get through those review sets in maybe 30 to 45 minutes. It's not that long, it's not that much time. And it will really pay them benefits later. Just build the strongest, solidest, densest foundation you can for these kids. Yes, it's so important. I think maybe some parents have concerns that can they really get through the entire textbook in one year? Um, and, you know, we're supposed to be doing it six days a week, year round, even without uh, summer school. That's what Dr. Robinson recommends. So how long do you think it takes to go through an entire book doing all of the things that you mentioned? Yes. And so what I didn't mention is mental math and problem solving, and those things will appear in some of the later editions. And I think they're worthwhile, but I'm not saying that they're the essentials. They're, it's good to do them, but it's not essential. Um, we have a special ed teacher who created intervention materials. She had a pullout program with her kids and using those intervention materials, she could go through every exercise in the book and get through two books in one school year. Wow, really, so two? She could get the kids who were a few years behind, she could get them caught up, special ed kids, get them caught up with the regular ed students. Now, I'm not saying you should go through two books a year. I think one book a year is fine, but there shouldn't be a problem. And if you don't start the kids too early, if you start them when they're really ready, then it shouldn't be a problem for them to get through one book a year. Yes. Some will go faster than that. Some might need to go slower, but learning it well is more important than going fast. Yes. I thank you so much for this talk. I, I feel like I learned a lot. I know there's a lot of insight here that will be really helpful to all parents, not just homeschooling parents. And I just really appreciate your insight and hearing some of your stories as well. It just gives you more appreciation for truly how unique and special Saxon Math is. So thank you for your contribution. Thank you for talking to us today. I really appreciate it so much. It's been very fun to, uh, to talk with you, Karen. And we'll see, maybe you'll get some more questions if so. I'm sure I will. <laughs> yeah, I get ready to come know. on the show again, yes. Thank you so much. And I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Bye.